Hello and welcome everybody. This is Shecky at the High Return Real Estate Show and we've got really just an amazing show for you today that I'm very excited about. Uh, today is a day that uh, Jack, my famous and illustrious business partner, is not with us. So you've got me uh, flying solo today as the interviewer. He's uh, uh, stuck in the hospital. His wife had a little surgery. I hear that everything is okay. So we are uh, anxious for full recovery and uh, expect him back here shortly. But that does not mean that we don't have a great episode for you because we've got really a uh, a guy who's been an absolute legend in the real estate investing industry for a very, very long time. And I'm going to introduce you to him in just a moment. Welcome to the High Return Real Estate Show, the podcast for heavy hitters. Two men, one mission. It's time to build your empire. Welcome back, everybody. The High Return Real Estate Show. This is Shecky. And today I have the honor of introducing to you a gentleman who not only has he flipped over 160 properties, uh, not only has he been involved in over $92 million worth of real estate transaction, but he is also a licensed financial advisor and has a few different really, really interesting perspectives and ways to fund properties and get more cash, which we always all want more cash. So I am very pleased to welcome Mr. Bruce Mack. Hello, Bruce. Hey there, Shecky. Thanks so much for having me on the uh, show today. I'm happy to have you and I'm anxious to dive in. So how does a guy like you end up flipping over 160 properties? And let's start there. I kind of want to get a little bit of your history and got, you got a lot of stuff under your belt. So how did you get started? How did you get to have such a, a high level of accomplishment? Well, way back when, uh, I used to be a corporate headhunter uh, and I, I placed my ex-wife. We negotiated for stock options and got 15,000 shares of stock options from a company called Broad Vision. And that came with a dilemma. The dilemma was, do we stay in California and get crushed on our taxes, or do we move to Nevada and try and negotiate a 4-3 work week and be able to take that money and use that to buy a really great house? Yeah. So uh, she saw the wisdom. We moved to Nevada. We cashed in the stock options. We're able to circumvent the... Uh, California state tax on those uh, stock options. And we built a dream house. The dream house was a 7,500 square foot house. And the idea then was let's create other dream houses for people who are buying secondary houses in, uh, in the Las Vegas Metroplex area. Unfortunately, these guys decided to run into the uh, world trade center and within a split second, the world as we know it changed and yeah. people coming to Vegas to buy second uh, houses that were multi-million dollar houses, it dried up. So I had to rethink exactly where I was and what I was going to uh, be doing. I decided to get into the pre-foreclosure arena and help distressed homeowners out uh, of their dilemma with their, with their distressed uh, 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 lifestyle and try and do a turnaround, help them out, put them on the correct path, and take care of them, do equity splits. And within a three year period of time, uh, I had bought, rehabbed, and flipped 160 properties. And that's really how I got started. It was a complete reversal, starting someplace else, going down a track, and ending up someplace completely different. Well, it's a great story because obviously the lesson there is, you know, let's face it, I, I, I cuss sometimes on this show, so I'm going to cuss now, but shit happens. And obviously none of us were necessarily prepared for what happened in 08. And many of us, including myself, got their asses handed to them on a silver platter. And so the fact that you were able to make lemons out of lemonade is 
fantastic and obviously helped a lot of distressed owners in the process too. So I think it's a, you know, win-win all the way around. So, so kudos to you. So, so from there, then how do you then transition? Cause you're doing some really, really cool stuff right now. And I, I do want to get into it, but you know, what happened between, you know, you know, after the fallout of 08 and now, I mean, that was a long time ago. How did things transition into the kinds of stuff that you're doing now? Well, I've been a licensed financial advisor for decades, and I have always had a fascination with both A, the financing component, part of the business, and B, with the asset protection uh, and potential tax mitigation aspect in the business. So I really wanted to meld that together. And uh, for me, the, the, the flipping and the rehabbing was, was great. Uh, I made millions of dollars, enjoyed it a lot, but it was not the end all for, for me. Uh, meaning I, I felt that there was life after that and a progression for me. Uh, so I wrote a book, Changing Your Financial Future. Uh, started to talk with people about financing, uh, and we created our own financing company out of it because there's so many people that fall into a void and that need the type of financing. We wanted to create niche products that people uh, didn't have. I mean, everybody's got hard money and or private money for doing uh uh, for doing houses, but then there's that void. And that void is that when you get approved, you have to come in with that 10%, that 15%, that 20% or more. Uh, if you're doing pre foreclosures, you need cash for keys, you need rehab money. And these monies are monies that uh, are best gotten if you don't have to collateralize uh, by, by putting up your house. And if you can get the, these kinds of monies, which we've been able to consistently do for our clients on an uncollateralized way, this is a huge win-win and can make the difference between them being able to move forward and do a deal and or not because they just didn't have the additional funds needed for the entire project and or to sustain it while they were uh, in the middle of that project to completion. Okay, so all of a sudden I'm you know, my little antenna are up here yeah. and uh, you know, you're throwing around this word uncollateralized yep. quite willy nilly. And I'm sure the listeners ears perked up when you said that just as mine did. So I'm, I want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit and sure. discuss, you know, like what does that mean? Like, how does that work? So, you know, let's take, you know, I don't know, let's take one of our properties and we've got a, Fifty-five, sixty thousand dollar property. How could an investor buy something like that uncollateralized? Okay, so let's just say that that um, our, our well, that you need needed the money for the entire property because in in your market, uh, as we were discussing just a few minutes ago, uh, your properties are anywhere from forty-five to seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars. Our yeah. average funding for our revolving lines of credit program is magically it happens to be seventy five thousand, and we do get people up to as much as one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we get them these numbers at zero percent APR for up to twenty one months. Nice. So the opportunity is based upon their FICO based upon a stated program, based upon not showing tax returns, and based upon not having collateralization, we can get this to happen once we start the process within seven to 14 business days. Now, some people think, well, I don't qualify because I don't have a great FICO. Uh, I used to have a 750 FICO, but because there was too much month and not enough money coming in, what I ended up doing is using my credit cards for certain parts of a project or my last project or for this or for that. Therefore, their balances on their existing credit cards started to creep. 40, 
50, 60, 70, 80%. Meaning if they have a $10,000 credit card that their utilization was at 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. Well, Shecky, here's the deal. Once somebody gets over 30% utilization on any one of their cards, their FICO starts to take a hit and it, get, it gets eroded and it starts to tube. The higher the utilization goes on more cards, the, the more the FICO starts to plunge. But we have a silver bullet and the silver bullet is, is this. And we've taken people who consistently used to have plus 700 scores, but today have low 600 scores because of this utilization problem. And we asked them, gosh, can you pay down those credit cards? Because with that, that's going to increase your scores. And then we can put you through our program and we can get you the average $75,000. And the usual response is, if I could, I would, but I can't. So I'm really in the catcher's catch 22. Yeah. So we actually have a solution. We have an in-house funding department that will lend our clients, depending, we need to look at the, each ind individual situation stands on its own. But in most cases, we will actually lend to our clients as much as $25,000 so that they can pay down their credit cards so we can get them down to that 30% utilization, which is the magic number that we really need them to be at so that their scores will go north like a rocket ship and then we can put them into the program so that they can get that average $75,000 as soon as we get them started. So that's, that's just one solution for us to be able to get them from where they are to where they want to go in a short period of time. That's fantastic. Right. So, and then obviously you're getting them other credit and then that opens up all kinds of opportunities and that sort of stuff, right? Sure. I can quickly tell you about another program that we've got. Sure. Many listeners that are uh, uh, and viewers that are, that are here today, some of them either have a rollable IRA or 401k, right? Or they have a rolled IRA or 401k that's currently with a self-directed administrator, which may or may not have checkbook capabilities. So let me uh, just so that we're all clear, myself yeah. included, all the listeners, mm -hmm. define the difference between rolled and rollable. Great question. So rolled is one that let's just say you used to work at General Dynamics and mm -hmm. you took it from General Dynamics and you put it with, oh, let's just say an equity or what have you. You rolled it out and now have it at your self-directed administrator so you have control over the funds. Okay. Roll, roll means it's still at General Dynamics, even though you've retired from General Dynamics, or maybe you still work at General Dynamics, but, what the, but the scenario is that you have another 50000 or more dollars that you rolled from your previous employer, which let's just say was Rocketdyne, and that's carve-outable or rollable. You can take that, that, that previous employer's uh, 401k and IRA and move that to a self-directed environment. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Sure. It, it, it sounds to me like what you're suggesting is that one of these products that you have is not uh, maybe a standardized self-directed IRA like what most people in the real estate investing world are talking about. It sounds like you have a little unique spin on that. Am I reading you correctly? Boy, oh boy. Absolutely, Shecky. We have what we call our BDRA, Business Directed Retirement Account, and here's the cool part about it. Regular self-directeds have very rigid terms and conditions. One of those terms and conditions is you cannot do any self-dealing. Mother, brother, sister, father, siblings, you cannot do interfamiliar transactions, otherwise you blow it up. Mm -hmm. and that's a problem because people want to work with the family oftentimes. And or you cannot go out and get a recourse loan on a property that is in your uh, that is in your self-directed uh, 
fund. And the reason is, is because they want you to, they, you cannot personally sign and have an external note against the IRA. Well, if recourse loans, and there are some available that are out there, problematically only will lend up to 50% of value. So <laughs> now you're not going to get enough funds. Right. With our BDRA environment, you can A, do anything you want with the family and any family member. B, you can have a recourse loan should you even need to or want to have an external loan. And C, you can use the funds for any business purpose whatsoever. So this is really cool. You can use it for rehab. So you don't necessarily have to be buying real estate. You can use, use it just for the rehab portion. So there doesn't need to be notes and, and these types of things against it or, or warranty deed or, or a trust deed that goes into the IRA. It's for any business purpose, which of course opens it up and makes it a huge opportunity to be able to access those funds without penalties. So this is great, and I'm, I'm guessing with your whole financial planning background, mm -hmm. you obviously figured out some nuance in the tax law. Because, yes. you know, obviously a self-directed IRA is somewhat rigid because, you know, you're getting some pretty distinct tax advantages, you know, by using, let's say, real estate as, a, as an investment instru instrument within your retirement account. Um, so with that is obviously going to come some limitations. They don't, IRS doesn't want you doing any funny shenanigans. So I, I love the flexibility of what you're calling your BDRA. I guess what I'm just trying to wrap my brain around and maybe some of the listeners right now are wondering the same thing is like, why is this so much different? What are the laws that, that you know that others don't know? I mean, how is this even possible? Well, I can tell you, Shecky, I speak all over the country on these types of programs, and uh, I'll even give you more on this BDRA, which is cool, because the way this is set up, um, the client can also contribute, which is another specialty and, and complete distinction between a normal self-directed they can contribute up to $53,000 annually on their salary tax deferred, which means that they don't need to take their RMDs or required minimum distributions uh, until 70 and a half. So there's even more good stuff. Uh, the, the general or the, the quick premise is we are setting up a internal 401k for the client and as such, we have all this flexibility. It keeps things within the confines uh, of the self-directed uh, environment so that there's not the 10% penalties and or the ordinary income because you're taking the money out. And we do all this uh, under the advisement and with our ERISA attorney who sets these all up. So uh, these are highly vetted, been in use for uh, decades, and we have a large block of very satisfied clients who love this vehicle because it's in so many ways, it's just superior. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And I do, uh, I want to talk to you about it more after we get done with this recording. It sounds very interesting to me. Um, the, the other area that you have become, you know, gain some notoriety in, and we get this kind of question from our investors all the time, is in the world of asset protection. And I know that, you know, obviously getting money is important, funding money is important, but once you get all that stuff done and you have a nice portfolio built, you know, it's clear here in the U.S. we live in a very litigious society and people will sue you at the drop of a hat and I think that asset protection is something that is very important. And I want you to speak to that just as far as, you know, I guess it's kind of a two part question is number one is why do people really need asset protection? Uh, and number two, what is really the best way to go about doing that? Great. Well, without giving you the long abridged 
uh, or I should say unabridged story. I myself, uh, one of those houses that, that of that 160, uh, actually two, uh, I got sued. Uh, I got sued on false premises uh, and it, it was a horrible situation. It was a $175,000 nightmare and it could have been a lot worse than that. So if you're not prepared as a real estate investor, it's really a fool's errand that you're embarking on if you're involved with real estate, because chances are you're going to end up at some point getting, getting sued. Um, it's just an uh, unfortunate reality. Uh, when I speak in front of people, I talk about statistics. One in three people get sued. In, when you take all verticals, when you take into consideration surgeons, 63% get sued. Can't find a statistic for real estate investors, but my best guess is it's a good 50-50. So you got a one and two shot of getting sued and it only takes one Yahoo to, to completely wipe you out. Now, people ascribe to utilizing an LLC. That's the standard uh, default asset protection move that we all think is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Unfortunately, I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble. It plain and simple, it ain't so. And the reason is, as real estate investors, we have what's called closely or tightly held entities. It's you, it's you and your wife or vice versa, husband or significant others, the case may be, and potentially a partner. So now you have the construct of an easily pierceable entity. And the reason is, is because the alter ego uh, hiding behind the facade of the entity can easily be proved because it's not 500 people. It's not even 50 people. It's just a couple of people. Yeah. And they get behind that veil. They can not only get to some of it, they can get to all of it, wipe you out, come against you personally, come against future assets and future income and take you apart for the rest of your life. People think umbrellas are a great idea. Oh, I'll just get an umbrella. Yeah, you can get an umbrella. And I can also tell you that that's a suit magnet for getting into even more litigation because when they do asset searches, they see an umbrella, they're coming after you. And umbrellas, when you get into multi-million dollar cases, oftentimes the suit limit transcends the umbrella limit and therefore you're still no better off and actually have drawn more attention to yourself. So utilizing a specialized trust like we've got with the law firm that I work with that is proprietary and copywritten. And we actually have 58 copyrights on it and over 30,000 of these trust instruments out in circulation since 1999. These trust instruments are impenetrable. Impenetrable. You cannot have a lien or a judgment attached to a trust. There's only one way you can get inside a trust. And I'll tell you what that is. That is in the case that fraudulent conveyance can be construed. And fraudulent conveyance can only be construed if you've been served, you've been given a summons, and then you try and transfer your assets into a trust. Well, that's trying to do things after the bell has been rung by unringing the bell. And we all know that can't happen. So, uh, that's problematic, and, and frankly, we, we cannot, will not, do not take people who want to participate in that type of activity. So people oftentimes ask me, when's the best time to get a trust? And I always say now, be, unless, because you haven't been sued, correct? And we vet that piece out. The other part about our trust is, and this is, goes right back to that proprietary and copywritten nature. We have a tax deferral component. And that tax deferral component defers not on W-2 income, but on short and long-term capital gains. And that's, of course, what we get when we sell a property, either short or long-term capital gains. And or as buy and hold, we get rental and lease income. 
and rental and lease income along with ordinary income, all of those different types of income can be forestalled from a tax perspective and are deferred because all gains go into the corpus of the trust to perpetuity. Now the laws of perpetuity so state that 21 years after the last of the, uh, of the uh, beneficiary's decease and the last of the beneficiary's heir's decease, the corpus of the trust or the trust disperses. Well, applying sense and logic to that, I'm not gonna be around, the, trust, the trustees are not gonna be around, the beneficiaries are not gonna be around, and we already said that their heirs are not gonna be around either. So at the time that the trust disperses, there is not a correlation of tax owed to somebody who is involved with or, or even not involved with that is, was an heir of the trust that has a responsibility to those taxes. Okay, the wait a minute, wait a minute. Huge. Yes, wait a minute. Now again, yeah. my antenna are up. So uh, yeah. are you suggesting yes. that the, okay, I, I set up a trust. Yes. I'm just going to use myself as the guinea pig for this sure. argument. I set up a trust. Yep. And um, I go and do, I don't know, I, I go and buy myself a nice little rental property. Yes. And that thing starts making nice regular passive income. Great. And I, I put that income in the trust. There are no, that income is not taxable until like three generations later, until I'm dead, the trustees are dead, and their beneficiaries are dead. That is absolutely correct. Pursuant to 643 of the IRS tax code, 643, 643B. Excellent. Okay. I hope everybody was listening to that because that's huge. Yeah. Like that's just like you've just figured out a way for real estate investors to really not pay taxes in their or future lifetime. Again, the taxes become deferred. The average client, the average client has a reduction in what they would have paid because is deferred out of usually 80 to 90 plus percent, which, which is majorly significant for them. So what happens, uh, so again, using me as the guinea pig, so yep. let's say uh, 20 years from now, I decide I don't want to leave this money in my trust, but I want to go on a world cruise and I want to take some money out of that trust to do that. Does that become a taxable event? There's three things that become taxable events for, uh, and they are what we call the three F's and the three F's are food, fun, and fashion. Now, okay. I think we just talked about potentially, depending upon how it's couched, fun, right? The mm -hmm. cruise. Yeah. However, if you're going on this cruise and you're going to be going to ports of call, and when you go to the ports of call, you're going to be looking at real estate and you're picking up cards and therefore there's an intent, then the trust likely would be able to have what we call a write offable trust expense. Got it. So again, each, each item needs to be looked at. Buying cars, well, that becomes a trust asset. So when the trust asset, i.e. the car, gets into an accident, who's liable? You're certainly not. And again, this is why I ascribe to trusts because the liability that would normally, contingent liability for, for objects that would be normally call, coming right back at you doesn't because like Rockefeller said, the object is to own nothing and control everything. And this yeah. truly is what happens when we get into a trust environment. However, getting back to uh, your question, uh, as a single person, you have a uh, annualized uh, $12,500 exemption from any tax whatsoever. As a married couple, it's 25, and if you have children, uh, each child is an additional $1,600 per year. So let's just say 
that that cruise was a $5,000, $6,000, $10,000 cruise that would fall well within just one of your exemptions. Therefore, you would not, uh, parenthetically, have any tax that you would have to pay. And if you went over that exemption, you're going to be in the lowest tax bracket, which would be 12.5%, which is a heck of a lot better than in the 30, 40 plus percent tax bracket, which is why we say, generally speaking, our clients have an 80 to 90% or so tax reduction in what, uh, what they're seeing on an annualized basis versus what they used to uh, uh, have, have to stroke checks for. This is fantastic. It's, uh, <laughs> it's clear to me that you have a lot of solutions for the kinds of investors that we talk to on a, on very much a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm, I'm happy that you have come on the show to, you know, expose people to this information because I think that it's, um, you know, the, the world of finances and financial planning and tax laws and all that is even to some of the best investors is daunting. And, uh, you know, like, like uh, even a guy like me, like I have no problem. I can look at a sheet and go, okay, what's the property cost? You know, what's the rent going to be? You know, what are the approximate expenses going to be? I can look at, you know, taxes, insurance, everything. Like it's a very black and white. I've looked at hundreds of those. It's a very black and white picture. But as soon as you start introducing, you know, taxes and depreciation and all that other kind of stuff, that's when kind of my eyes start rolling around in my head. And I, I'm a reasonably successful investor, but I just, you know, it's just sort of that, like, that's a, that's next level kind of stuff. And that's why, you know, we need guys like you to help really make this clear and understand and explain. So I know you very generously uh, offered to help our listeners in, in a very, very nice way. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain this very special thing that you're going to be able to do for our listeners. Well, I'm glad to. I want to give you one other, um, if you will, before I quickly segue into that. Of course. One of the things that so concerns me, uh, if you start to accrue multiple properties, is that uh, you are not invoking uh, long or short-term uh, capital gains when selling uh, and or uh, holding, but you could be construed as a dealer. Uh, and dealer status is something that I just quickly want to say is not possible when you have a trust and dealer status then not only has all income coming in as uh, ordinary income instead of shorter long-term capital gains, but it also then you get tagged with self-employment tax. So these are some of the, uh, uh, of the things that can happen uh, to an individual. And on that note, um, you were so kind to uh, tell me uh, before we got on the air that uh, I can uh, let people know how to find us and should they uh, want to get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, confidential, of course, consultation on either the financing component, the trust component, or potentially both, um, I'm more than glad uh, to work uh, with and for really hard for your uh, listeners uh, to get them the information that they need to make uh, good, sound, viable uh, decisions on uh, what financing solutions and or uh, the trust solution uh, to, to get with and move with going forward. Um, the, there's a couple of different ways you can get in touch with me. First of all, feel free uh, and email me uh, directly. You can email me at bruce at platinumfinancinggroup.com. And yes, there are two G's there, bruce at platinumfinancinggroup.com. Easier, you can email me at bruce at platinumtrustgroup.com. <laughs> and or we're Set, we've set up a special page for your listeners. So you can go to platinumtrustgroup.com or they can go to platinumtrustgroup.com, I should say, forward slash Shecky, S-H-E, 
C-K-Y, Shecky. So there it's quantumtrustgroup.com forward slash Shecky, S-H-E-C-K-Y. And um, on either of those uh, uh, modalities, actually, if you go to the, uh, the, the forward slash Shecky, there's that will also on there direct you to a online real-time calendar so you can get an appointment uh, and we can do a complimentary consultation and see where the conversation may take us. This is fantastic. So I want to encourage all the listeners to uh, go to that link, which is platinum financing or no, platinum trust group yep. dot com forward slash Shecky. I don't know, you just made me famous again, S-H-E-C-K-Y, platinumtrustgroup.com forward slash Shecky. And that's where you'll be able to book a call with Bruce and or his team for free. And there's no obligation. And I, this is really wonderful and generous that you can do this because like I said, this is a, this is a certain level of complexity that is oftentimes difficult for investors to get, but it's such a huge key component and piece to building real wealth and protecting real wealth. So uh, I appreciate your very, very generous offer. And uh, hopefully you'll get a lot of people that, that take you up on it. And there's some really, really great things that become of it. So um, anyway, I don't, I think we got a pretty good show here. I don't really want to make it, you know, any more, complex than it already is, but I, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and uh, teaching us about all these different components that we may not otherwise have known about. And so thank you, Mr. Bruce Mack. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Shecky, for allowing me to come on your show today. It's been a pleasure and I look forward uh, to hearing from uh, the listeners who are on the show, so we can take them through the different scenarios that pertain to them and design a program that's going to work the best for them should they wish to move forward. Awesome. And again, listeners, thank you. If you got value out of it, give us a thumbs up, give us a five stars on iTunes or say something nice about us on whatever platform you're looking at this or watching on YouTube or whatever. Um, we really appreciate your listenership and uh, thank you everybody for being here. And that's another show. Thank you.